Hello again, everybody. So in this video, we're going to move out of the finite world and into the infinite world, but maybe the not-too-infinite world, right? Whatever that's going to mean. So we're going to talk about what are called countably infinite sets. So we had before said a set was finite, so say a set S, if you could build a bijection between S and what we called N, right, or N bar, which was a finite set of numbers, right, from 1 to N. Okay, so this is what meant you had a finite set. Okay, well, sort of the, the obvious limit of this process, right, as N gets larger, right, 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 up to N, right, as n gets larger, this thing is is filling up all of the positive integers. And so what we might do is say, well, what if you can't build a bijection between s and one of these n sets? But what if you could build a bijection with the set of positive integers? Well, now it makes sense to refer to your set as infinite, because we think of this set as having an infinite number of elements. Okay, so that's actually going to be our, our definition, okay, but what we're going to call a countably infinite set. So, so this is our definition. A set S is countably infinite. If there is a bijection, from, and we're actually going to write it backward uh, for uh, whatever reason, it doesn't really matter, from the set of positive integers to S. Now, of course, it's a bijection, and we have a theorem that says if you have a bijection, then you get an inverse bijection going the other way. So I could go from S to the positive integers or vice versa. The reason I'm doing it this way is I want to, when I write down my function, to make it obvious that I'm using the positive integers to count elements of S. All right, and it's just maybe a little more conceptually easier to write it down in this direction. But it doesn't matter because bijections, right, work in both directions. Okay, so let's do an example. So this is based on an example we actually had before. I'm just going to uh, turn turn things around a little bit. Uh, so let's say I have a function g going from the positive integers to the even positive integers. So remember, when I write the times 2, that just means multiply every positive integer by 2. That's how I get all the even positive integers. Okay, so we've seen this function before. And so if I had some little n, right, some positive integer, I'm going to map that to g of n, and that's going to be defined just as, as doubling the number. You get 2 times n. Okay, and we saw in a previous video this is a bijection. And so what that tells us is that because we have a bijection from the positive integers to twice the positive integers, right, to so the even positive integers, the set of even positive integers is a countably infinite set. Furthermore, because we have a bijection, that our definition of cardinality, of, of having the same cardinality, is that the positive integers and the even positive integers have the same cardinality. Right? So the cardinality of the positive integers is equal to the cardinality of the even positive integers. And this is, is counterintuitive, perhaps, right? You, you, on, I mean, on the one hand, it seems very natural. You say, look, it's an infinite set. The other one's an infinite set. Uh, they have the same size. On the other hand, if you started writing down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., and you started saying, well, look, I have 2 and 4, and we well, okay, keep going here with 6, and there's an 8. Well, it, it definitely looks like the list on the right is a lot sparser than the list on the left. All right? But when we're trying to decide whether two sets have the same size, we're not beholden to spacing like this. Okay? We can rewrite it. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. And then these just pair right up. And that's what we mean when we say they have the same cardinality. We can build 
this pairing between them, this bijection between them. Okay, so we now know that the set of positive even integers is countably infinite. All right, uh, our next example is actually going to be a theorem, but it's maybe a little more surprising because here, okay, we have something which on one hand looks like it should be half as big, but eh, you know, you just shift it a little bit and you can see, yeah, yeah, okay, there's the same number. But what if we replace these even positives with a set that seems a lot bigger than the integers? Like say the set of all fractions, okay? So the rational numbers. Certainly that, you shouldn't be able to build a bijection between them. But amazingly, Q is countable. So this is very, very surprising. Okay, so unpacking this definition, there is a bijection from the set of positive integers to Q. All right, so um, I'm going to prove this, but before I do, I, I just want to show you sort of the, um, the classic way of understanding why this could be true. Okay, first, it seems unbelievable because even if you just look between like, I don't know, zero and, or we say one and two, there are an infinite number of rational numbers between one and two. So how are you going to somehow build this bijection? How would you, if you like, count all of the rational numbers? And so what traditionally we would do is say, okay, we'll start writing down the integers. Okay, and I'm skipping zero here, but don't, don't you worry about that so much. So I start writing down the positive integers. And now what I could do is draw a little picture here. I'm gonna start with a dot in the upper left corner. I'm gonna to move to the right, and then I'm gonna go diagonally. Okay, I'll come down, move up, move up again diagonally. Okay, now I come down. Oh, actually, uh, let's go over first. Okay, we'll come over. Okay, now I can come down, come down again, come down again. And I come down, now I back up the diagonal. Here, 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 and up here. And I could keep going, okay? I could keep going forever and ever. And the point is that if I do this, I'm going to hit everywhere in this grid that I should get, right? And I can now think of any position in this grid as a, as a pair, right? So for example, I could look here and I could think of this as maybe two comma five, or if you like, two fifths. And every rational number, at least positive rational number, so I take something like five ninths, well, that should show up five, and then somewhere over here, we get seven, eight, nine. We could get that right here, and eventually, this tail, in fact, we call this a dovetail, this tail is going to eventually go through there. And so the point is, we really can count out all of the rational numbers. Okay, there's some little flaws in this picture. For example, we don't have the negative numbers. Uh, also, you're going to get a lot of repetition. So for example, uh, over here, we have two comma two, which is two over two, which is one, but we also have three comma three, right? Which is also one. So in terms of, you know, injectivity here, like we got all sorts of issues. However, this should suggest that it's possible, all right? That we just need to be careful when we do the proof. And, and so that's what we're gonna do now. We're gonna be very careful about it, okay? But this should at least make you believe there is some path that goes through all the rational numbers. All right, so let's try to prove this. So our goal, right, is to find a bijection let's call it f from the positive integers to q so step one i need for this function if it's a bijection to be surjective so i need to get every rational number and so i need to get zero. Zero is a rational number and so i'm just going to throw get that out of the way f of one is going to equal zero Okay, fine. So I know zero has a pre-image. 
fine. Now I just need to get all the rest of the rationals. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a set. Let's call it A sub 2. And A sub 2 is going to consist of all of the fractions, right, whose numerators and denominators are co-prime. So I only want fractions which have been reduced. Okay, I'm trying to get rid of this, you know, 3 over 3 problem. So I'm only going to look at fractions which have been reduced and where their numerators and denominators add up to 2. Now, there's actually two of those, right? If they add up to two, there's, there's not a whole lot of options. Um, and, and of course, I'm not going to use zero, right? So these, these are all going to be positive numbers, numerator and denominators. So one way you can see to do it is going to be one over one, okay? They're, those are co-prime uh, numerators and denominators. I can't reduce that anymore. And they add up to two, and that, that's kind of it. Uh, but what I'm always going to do whenever I, in, for the rest of this proof, whenever I write down a fraction like this, I also need to write down the negative of that fraction. Okay, it's always going to come second. So I'll have 1 over 1 and negative 1 over 1. And I'm putting parentheses here, not because this is a, an ordered pair, but rather this is a list. So the order is going to matter. So now I use this list to help define my function. So f of 2, right, I have to send 2 somewhere f of 2 is going to be 1 over 1, and f of 3 is going to be negative 1 over 1. Okay, next step, I'm going to define a sub 3. For a sub 3, it's going to be done in the same way, except now I want the numerator and denominator to add up to 3. Okay, now there's going to be some more options here, and so in order to make an ordered list, I'm going to assert the following. When I write these down, I'm going to order them, forgetting about the negatives, in increasing order. So if I want the numerator and denominator to add to 3, and I'm only allowed to use positive integers, then it's either going to be 1 over 2 or 2 over 1. Okay, And I'm putting them in this order because a half is less than, than 2 over 1. And of course, then I also need to always put down the negative versions of these. And that's it. Those are the only options. And so from here, I now define f of 4 to be 1 half, f of 5 to be negative 1 half, f of 6 to be 2 over 1, and f of 7 to be negative 2 over 1. All right. And maybe you're starting to see a pattern here, how I'm going to be building the rest of this function. Well, OK, let's try a, uh, a4 next, just to make sure we're all getting it. So for a4, I, now I need the numerator and denominator to add up to 4. Okay, well, I could do 1 over 3. I could do 2 over 2. But, ooh, hold on. 2 over 2, those are not co-prime. They're both divisible by 2. I could reduce that fraction to 1 over 1. So I throw that out. Okay, so I have 1 over 3. I don't use 2 over 2. Then I could have 3 over 1. And then, of course, I also need their respective negatives. Ah, and so f of 8 is going to be 1 third. f of 9 will be negative 1 third. f of 10 will be 3 over 1. And f of 11 will be negative 3 over 1. And I just continue in this way. Okay, So continue by letting a sub n always equal to, right, well, I'll just write it in words, right, the list of all fractions, okay, whose numerators and denominators, denominate, whoop, Let's try to spell correctly. Denominators are positive, co-prime, and sum to n. Okay. Ordering by increasing order. And then inserting their respective negations. 
Okay, so I have to just toss the negatives in. Uh, negations. Okay, that's how we define the an. We then define or extend our definition of f. as above. Okay. And the point is, I will be able to get every rational number to somehow be a uh, an image of f, right? Because if r is some rational number, then r is equal to, well, either plus or minus, we don't know if it's positive or negative, some p over q where p and q are positive integers. And well, OK, I, it could be that p is 0, but we've already let, that's kind of a special case that we've already handled. So p and q are positive integers and co-prime. OK, so we've reduced the fraction. OK, and in this case, we know, so then, So this R is now going to show up in A, P plus Q. So you look at the set of these where the sum of the numerator denominator is P plus Q. Well, okay, there's an example of such a one. Okay, so this tells us that F is going to be surjective. So thus F is surjective and we also are going to get our injectivity because we are never repeating anything, right? The only way we could repeat a rational in general was this problem here with like three over three. But we're getting rid of that by only looking at the, the fractions where we have co-prime numerator and denominator. Okay, so since no rational number uh, appears twice in any a sub n or in multiple a's, and I'll just put a dot there because I don't want to put any sort of letter, f is injective. Okay, so we have surjectivity and injectivity, which implies that F is bijective. And that completes the proof. So this actually shows, so therefore, the cardinality of the rational numbers is equal to the cardinality of the positive integers. And Again, on the one hand, this feels a little weird because they're so tightly packed, right? The Qs are dense even in the real numbers. On the other hand, you might say, but yes, because infinity is infinity, right? That We're not going to be able to do any better than this, right? Well, not right. So in a future video, uh, we're going to actually prove that the set of real numbers is uncountable, meaning there is no bijection from the positive integers to the reals. That'll be pretty interesting. All right, we'll see you next time.